Okay, this is my sister Ann. We, we're, the, we're the thrash kids, although she's married now. And um, thrash kids, yeah, we're the only two. Um, wanted to tell you a little bit about the beginnings of Uchi Pines and actually even going further back than that from the perspective of the thrashes. Um, you would never know this from, especially those people who live here at Uchi Pines, you would never know this, but when we were growing up, Ann was actually the one that did all the talking. <laughs> and uh, so she was the one who, who talked and I was just kind of, you know, was along for the ride. But of course now, um, here at Uchi Pines, everybody thinks that you can't shut me up. And so I don't know how that happened, but somehow along the way, we, we did that. But I thought I that I, I would let her well, kind of begin because she somehow knows all of these details that I don't know about uh, my parents growing up. And it's because I'm older. <laughs> I guess so. I, I wasn't there. I don't there, remember my so, parents' you know. childhood. I don't remember that part. Okay, but we thought we would start and start off really kind of at the beginning with um, mom and dad. And, uh, and then we'll go forward from there. Why don't we have a word of prayer and then we'll start. Father, we're so thankful once again in your guidance. Thankful that you've been with us all these years. And as we look at some of the early history of Uchi Pines and what you've done, I pray that you would bless, be here with us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'd just like to start out by saying this whole thing is a story about grace. It's so good to look out and see a few familiar faces here this morning. And some of these stories may be familiar to some of you um, because you may have been here, lived through some of it. Um, but it's all about grace. It's all about something God did because there's no way that two people from South Georgia could have done what happened here. That's right. So my father, Calvin Thrash, was born in Gay, Georgia, which is about 50 miles north of Columbus. It's between Columbus and Atlanta. And Gay is just a little spot in the road. Um, it's they, the, the main crop when he was growing up there was cotton, and the other big crop was peaches. And he grew up working in the fields. And this instilled in his heart a deep desire to leave the farm forever. <laughs> that was just all he wanted to do, <laughs> was get away from the farm. When he was about three years old, three or four years old, uh, the family house burned down. My grandfather was so panicked at when the house began burning that all he had time to grab was his rifle. He was afraid that it would go off in the fire, that it would fire in the fire. You know what I'm saying. And he grabbed a box of cornflakes. He had ulcers, and his doctor had prescribed him cornflakes to eat. And that was all he grabbed on his way out the door, him, that and the kids, his gun, his cornflakes, and the kids. So out they ran. They began to live with my great-grandmother, my grandfather's mother. She was older, of course, by this time, and everybody thought, oh, Miss Ari Lilly ain't going to live long, so we're just going to live with, that, with, with her for a few years, just a couple years, till she dies. My great-grandmother lived for the next 30 years. And, <laughs> and she was not a real easy person to live with, but we've all felt that that contributed to my grandmother's sainthood because she truly was a saint. My dad's mother was a wonderful, wonderful person, kind and sweet and loving. She was a school teacher, and she taught second grade most of her career. And everybody thought that it was in part, living with her mother-in-law that made her that way. <laughs> she was just a wonderful person. My father told a story of how his father insisted that every day during cotton season, he and, his, and my uncle, his brother, had to pick a full bag of cotton every day. Now, a bag of cotton isn't like a grocery bag. It was a bag about six feet tall and about this big around and had to be crammed full of cotton and because all cotton was picked by hand in those days. And so one day, 
my grandfather was away from home doing some kind of business and my dad and my uncle were busy doing the things that boys do when they get home from school and somehow they just never got that bag of cotton picked. And so um, they, it finally got dark and they ate their supper and they went to bed, secure in the knowledge that there was no way that Papa would make them get up and pick cotton in the middle of the night, <laughs> except that their security was absolutely in, misplaced. <laughs> when, when Papa got home, he, they were not asleep yet, and he pokes his head in the door of their bedroom, and he says, so boys, did you pick your cotton today? And they're like, no, sir, we didn't, we didn't, get, that, we didn't get that done today. And he's like, oh, get up. And so they went out, and by light of a lantern, they picked, they picked their bag of cotton before they went to sleep that night. <laughs> and I don't know if you're aware of it, but Dad did that trick to me, too. <laughs> It wasn't surprised. a bag of cotton that he did. He told me he wanted a five-gallon bucket of beans, and I got busy the same way, doing riding the bicycle and doing this and that and the other thing. And after he got back home, he gave me a flashlight, and he says, where's my... Where's my beans? And I said, well, I didn't get that done. And he says, well, here's your light. And he can go out and pick the beans. So he was well trained. So it The question works. is, did you do that? Uh, uh, we won't no, go there. No, We're not no, going there. I, I didn't do that. But uh, I will say this, that when he asked me to pick beans after that, I picked the beans. <laughs> <laughs> my father's eyesight was very bad. It turned out that he was essentially legally blind. And it wasn't until he was 12 years old that he got his first pair of glasses. He would sit on the front row of the schoolroom, the little schoolhouse where they went there and gay, and he would press against the side of his eye because that distorted his focal length just enough that he could see the blackboard if he looked really hard and sat right on the front row of the school. When he was 12, he got his first pair of glasses and he said that the whole world just opened up. All of a sudden, he could see leaves on the trees. Prior to this, when the occasional, very rare airplane would fly over, all the children would run out of the schoolhouse and would look, there's an airplane, there's an airplane, and Dad would be like, where, where? And now he could see airplanes in the sky. His whole world opened up, everything changed for him. He was an excellent student. Everywhere that he went, he set academic records. He was just a very, uh, he was a smart kid. And this opened doors for him to go to college and eventually to medical school, and this was his ticket off the farm forever, he thought. <laughs> My mother, Agatha Thrash, was born in Baxley, Georgia. Now, if you've never heard of Baxley, I'm not surprised. Perhaps you've heard of Brunswick, Georgia, or perhaps you've heard of Valdosta. Maybe you've heard of Savannah, if you haven't heard of any of those other towns. But South Georgia is where she grew up way south, close to the Okefenokee Swamp. She was a country girl, grew up on a dairy farm. Her parents were dairy farm. While her dad was a dairy farmer, her mother was a school teacher. She also taught second grade in Baxley, Georgia. Mother absolutely adored her father. Her father, Norwood Moody, was a godly man, a good man, eventually became the sheriff of Appling County, of which my mother was inordinately proud. But one day, as they were talking, she would follow him around the farm, helping with various tasks. He gave her a horse, and she named the horse Nell, I believe. I think she named the horse Nell. <laughs> it's, been a while there, since, I... it's been a while since I've heard this story, but um, she would ride the horse to bring the cattle in when it was time for them to come in and be milked. She loved that horse. She would ride it everywhere. Anytime she wasn't with her dad, she was on her horse. One day, as she and her dad were talking, just going about their chores in the dairy, my grandfather said to my mother, he said, baby, he said, if I had my life to live over again, I would be a doctor. And that sparked in her mind a great desire to be what he thought would be the ultimate in a life career. She, from that point forward, wanted to be a doctor and nothing else was interesting to her. Medicine it was from that point forward. This set the course of her life. So she did enroll in medical school. 
This is her first year class student identification card for the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. She saved all of her ID cards from every year of medical school. My dad did not, not surprisingly. But she, in 1951, she enrolled in the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Uh, she loved medicine. She was thrilled beyond words to be there. She had worked hard to make the grades that would make admission into medical school possible. And here she was. She was thrilled. My father, meantime, had already been at the Medical College of Georgia for two and a half years when, at Christmas time of his junior year of, med of medical school, he went home ill. He just wasn't feeling good. He was running a little fever. He felt bad. He agreed to see the family doctor, and the doctor diagnosed him with tuberculosis, which, by all means of reckoning, should have meant the end of his medical career. Very few medical students were allowed back to medical school. Tuberculosis was at that time considered the plague of medical students. And he spent nine months, he went into Batty Hospital, which was the Georgia uh, TB sanatorium at that time um, for treatment. I'm not sure exactly what they gave him. Streptomycin had just started being used at that time, um, but he spent nine months in the TB hospital, resting, lying around, totally bored, wishing, hoping, maybe even praying, because he was pretty desperate, that he could go back to medical school. Some people went to bat for him. Some of, the, some of his professors there at the medical college went to bat for him with the administration, urging that they re-accept him when he was released from the hospital. And in fact, they did. But he had to sit out two years because he missed the first year that he went into the hospital. And then he, since he wasn't ready to go back into school that fall, he had to miss the entire second year. I have to think that that was providential because that fall of the first year that my dad was out of medical school, my mother entered medical school. If he had continued on, he might not have even known her, a lowly little freshman, you know, where he would have been a senior. So I think God works, <laughs> works in mysterious ways. Um, he got out of hospital in October and called a friend of his, his best friend in, at, in Augusta there, who was also a medical student. His name was Hugh. And he said, Hugh, he said, I want to come down for the Thanksgiving party and dance that the, that the medical college held for the, for the students. And he said, can you get me a date? I don't, I don't know anybody. And he had actually broken up with his longtime girlfriend while he was in the hospital. And or she had broken up with him. I'm not quite sure how that worked. But um, he, uh, he said he needed a date. And he asked Hugh if he would work it out for him. So Hugh said, well, let me see what I can do. Hugh talked with his fiance, who happened to be roommate with a young woman by the name of Agatha Moody. And she asked my mom if she would be willing to be the blind date for Calvin Thrash. And mother agreed, and not terribly enthusiastically, but she, you know, she was willing. She was willing to go out on dates. It was, sure, why not? So she agreed to go out, and that night of the party, she was babysitting at the First Baptist Church for a meeting that was being held. But as soon as the babysitting gig was over, um, her friends and my dad picked her up, and my dad said as she walked out of the church, he was just struck with how beautiful she was. Ooh. And that was it. They really never looked at anybody else again after that point. They, um, two years later, they were married in Baxley, in my mother's home church, First Baptist Church of Baxley, Georgia. And that was in 1953, June 14 of 1953. They were married. And this started a series of events, this marriage. Who knew what would happen?
from this union. But God was working. They went from the Medical College of Georgia, once they were both graduated there, to do a residency, a, I should say an internship in Louisville, Kentucky. And then they moved to Atlanta, where mother and dad both began residencies at Emory University. Um, mother in pathology, dad in internal medicine. And not long after this, Uncle Sam came calling for my dad. Uh, and he was, he entered the military, entered the army, did his training at Fort Sam Houston in uh, San, San Antonio, Texas, and then was stationed in Fort, at Fort Benning, which is just right here across the river here by Columbus. Mother, meantime, was finishing her residency and doing some work at Emory University in Atlanta. And it was during this time that I was born. Um, my dad said that he thought that he might have to be AWOL the day that I was born because he couldn't find anybody to sign his leave slip to, to be gone for my birth, to be, to be in Atlanta for my birth. But somehow he made it. After my dad's stint in the military and after my mother was finished with her education in, in Atlanta, they decided to settle in Columbus, Georgia. They just felt that it would be a good place. Uh, it was sort of midway between her parents and his parents and a big enough city that they could establish the kind of practices that they hoped to have. They were both very ambitious young people and they wanted to make their mark on the world, and they thought that Columbus would be a good place to do that. They bought a little house on Calvin Drive, which is interesting to me that they found a place on Calvin Drive to establish their, my dad's medical practice. Mother was um, the assistant pathologist at St. Francis Hospital and later became the head pathologist there. But my dad, they bought, they bought three or four lots of land right here on the corner of Calvin Drive and Warm Springs Road. There was a little house where my dad established his first op medical office and which later became our first health food store, Country Life, uh, Staff Alive, before we named it Country Life. Then they built this two building office, stressed so that they could add two more stories to it because my mother intended to build a medical empire. She had every intention of being a millionaire by the time she was 40, which at that time was pretty young to be a millionaire. She was going to establish Thrash Labs as a nat at least to cover the Southeast, perhaps to cover the nation. She wanted it to be the lab corp of today. You know, she wanted it to be that. She wanted, she had big plans. They were going to make a difference. But God had even bigger plans for them. Um, mother also bought an airplane. My dad bought the airplane, actually. She and, he and my mother started learning how to fly. My dad hated it. My mother loved it. Um, mother logged enough hours to, be, uh, to get her certification for instrument rating, but she never actually did that. She enjoyed visual flight rules. She loved to fly. And this was her little airplane. Um, she would tuck me into the little hat rack in the back, Cal would also fly in it, and neither one of us remember that airplane. No, I think that was before car seats too. That was, it was before I'll, car I'll seats. Think they would, I don't think they would make you have a helmet on now. Don't tell how old we now. are, but that was a long time ago. There was no such thing as car seats back then. So, we would fly around. Mother intended that this would be her way to spread Thrash Labs, that she could service and uh, different locations of thrash labs around the southeast using her airplane. But, as I said, God had bigger plans. Cal and I completed the picture. They had everything this world could offer. They had success, good reputations, happy family, money, jobs they loved, um, influence in the community. They had everything they thought, except for one thing, and that was Jesus. They had, my dad had never been a particularly religious person, and my mother, who had been raised in a very devout home, had abandoned her faith during medical school. Um, 
And there's some interesting stories about that, but just suffice it to say that she left faith in God. And as they both went deeper into medical school, they both became very committed to a, 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 at least an agnostic, if not an atheistic, evolutionary uh, the picture of God. That was what they that was what they believed that it was totally up to them to make their way in the world. My mother was about to sit for her uh, national board examination in pathology, and the exams that year were being held in Seattle, Washington. My dad decided to go with her, and they were going to they decided that they would make a trip of it. This would be their first real vacation in many years. So they left Cal and me in the care of our housekeeper, and they flew from Atlanta to Seattle. Not in their plane, but flew commercial. As they got onto the airplane, my dad carrying my mother's microscope in its microscope case, a man who was sitting on the airplane looked up at them and said, I know where you're going. You're going to write your board examinations in pathology in Seattle. And my dad said, well, actually, not me. That's my wife. She's the one who's going to do that. And, but yes, we are on our way to, to Seattle. They um, made acquaintance with the man again, the doctor, who was also on his way to write board exams in pathology. And when they got to Seattle, they started just kind of hanging out together because, after all, they were both from Georgia and they wanted to, you know, hang out with someone who was sort of familiar. It turns out that Dr. Thompson was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was meeting up with two or three of his friends who were also writing their board exams. They were all Loma Linda alumni. And they, they introdu he introduced my parents to his friends one day. While my mother was writing her exams, my dad spent his time scoping out all the best things to do in Seattle and the best places to eat. And so at the end of the board examinations, my mother realized two things that were very odd about this doctor. One was he actually was qualified to write two parts of the exams while she was only qualified to write the first part he wouldn't write the second part because the exam was going to be held on Sabbath. And she was like, why won't you do that? This would make a big difference in your career if you can do both parts of this exam. She was only qualified to do one part. She couldn't imagine why he wouldn't write this exam. Can't you get your preacher to let you off once? And he said, well, it's really not, not like that. <laughs> it's not like that. At the second thing that really was odd to her was at the end of the board examinations, my parents decided to invite Dr. Thompson, their fellow Southerner, and his two friends, two or three, out to eat dinner to celebrate the end of the exams and that they had done a good job and they were all happy and relieved to be finished. And so he had found this fabulous seafood restaurant to eat at. So he took them all there. And so he was like, oh, this is really good on this menu, and this is really good, this is really good. And, and they all ordered vegetable plates. He said, he said uh, don't worry, money is no object, just order whatever you yeah, want just to. Get whatever you, you, want. you don't have yeah. to worry about it. You can yeah. order the lobster, whatever you want to order, it's yeah. not a problem. They, they all ordered the vegetable plates. <laughs> and my dad was like, don't you want some of the seafood? This is one of the most famous seafood restaurants in the United States. And they said, well, we, we don't eat seafood because of what the Bible says. What? They couldn't believe that this wonderful opportunity to eat this amazing food would be passed by, by these people. So they thought this was really strange. But they put all of that out of their minds and made their trip home. They rented a car in Seattle and drove back home to Columbus uh, across the country, just seeing the sights and having a great time. When they arrived back in Columbus, my mother had recently installed some equipment in her laboratory, some new, brand new equipment. Um, and it just happened that she and Dr. Thompson had installed the same, he worked 
at Emory. And he had, they had installed the same equipment at the lab in Emory. Mother started having some problems with this equipment. She could not get it to work. So she called him up. She thought maybe, he, maybe they've had the same problem. She called up Dr. Thompson in Atlanta and she asked him if he had had any experience with this particular problem that she was having with the equipment. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, we have. And he told her what to do. She did what he said, and it fixed the problem. Everything was great for one week. And then the equipment broke down again. She couldn't get it to work. She thought, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just call him again. It worked, what he said worked last time, so I'll call him again. She called him up. Have you had this problem, she asked. As a matter of fact, they had. And so he told her what to do, and she did what he said, and it fixed the problem for one week. And a week later, the equipment broke down again. Are you starting to see grace at work here? You know that sometimes the things that we think are the worst problems in our lives are actually God's best tools to change our lives. So she called him up again, but this time she was really embarrassed to call him. She knew that his time was very valuable. She knew how much money he was making. She hated to just be a pain in the neck to him. So she, she called him with the question, but also with an offer. She said, I would like to have you be a consultant for me, if you would. Could you be a professional consultant? I'll give you a retainer. If you would come down once a month, review cases with me, speak to my students in medical technology. She was teaching by this time at Columbus, well, today it's Columbus State University, it was Columbus College then. Um, she said, if you would teach, if you would speak to my students once a month, review cases, and just, you know, be, be consultant with me, I would really like that kind of a relationship with you. And he agreed. So he came down. And the first month, that he came down, they were looking at slides, and as he looked at one person's slides, he, it, was, it obviously showed cancer, and he shook his head. He said, mm, unless there's a miracle, this person is not long for this world. And mother said, but of course you don't believe in miracles, and uh, we don't believe in miracles. And he said, well, actually, I, I do believe in miracles. She thought, that's really strange. You know, she's just racking up all these strange things about this man. But he was so intelligent. He was obviously well educated. He was a very good doctor. So that just made it even more strange that he believed in miracles. The next month, he was down again. And as they talked, he made some comment about the wonderful way that God created us. And she said, by this time she's catching on. <laughs> There's some really strange things about this guy. And she says, you don't believe in creation, do you? And he said, yes, I do believe. And she thought, this is, this is, this is weird. He's an educated man, he's a scientist. How can he believe in this stuff? On his way out of town that day, Dr. Thompson stopped at a payphone, because there was no such thing as cell phones back in the early 60s. He, she, he stopped at a payphone and said, called up the local Seventh-day Adventist pastor, Pastor Roland Roof, some of you may know Elder Roof, and asked him if he would stop by and visit Dr. Thrash. And he did. He stopped by and he brought her a book. She wanted to pay him for it. Of course, he wouldn't accept payment. The book was Life, Man, and Time. And as she read the book, she started to see that there perhaps could be some scientific foundation for the notion of creationism. And, and it made her feel happy because her dad was a creationist and she adored and respected her dad, but she didn't understand how this smart man like her dad could believe in creation. Now she thought, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's okay. A few weeks later, Dr. Elder Roof came by again with another book and an invitation to her to a meeting at church, which she attended with me. I don't remember it, but we went. And she blocked out most of the sermon because that was how she did when she went to church. She took us kids to church every 
you know, a couple times a year, Easter, because we had to show off new Easter clothes. And sometimes at Christmas we would go. But she went, she kind of slept through most of it, but she picked up just enough because she always wanted to make some witty comment to the pastor when she left the church to let him know that she'd heard something. And he'd spoken about, he spoke about sin in the lecture that he gave. And as she walked out of the sanctuary, the little tiny wooden Seventh-day Adventist church on 17th Street in Columbus, which is no longer there, <laughs> tiny little building. It was maybe half the size of this building, maybe. She says to the pastor, the speaker, she said, wouldn't it be great if sin came with a label on it? We could always tell what's bad and what's good. And he looks at her and he smiles. He says, well, sister, we must pray. And she thought, whoa, these people are really serious. <laughs> They're weird. <laughs> and shortly after that, she heard that Elder Roof had left the area. And she was very relieved because now all obligation was done. Except that a couple months after Pastor Roof left, a knock came at her. Our door at yeah. the house and the only reason she went to that meeting was because she wanted to pay for the book that's right she wanted to put something in the offering plate to pay for the books that he had given to her a knock came at the door and the person standing at the door was elder AC Becker um, elder Becker was a good German Pennsylvanian and he was persistent and when she brushed him off the first time, he came back and knocked again at our door. This time she let him in, but she said, my husband's coming back any minute, and when he comes back, you have to leave because we have plans. My dad was delayed two hours that night. <laughs> you see Grace at work. And Elder Becker talked with my mother that whole time, just friendly chat mostly, but he invited her to visit their church. She looked at him and said, with a dead serious intention, she said, I can't think of anything I'd rather do less than go to your church. If I were gonna go to any church, it would not be yours. She was just that straight with them. Very rude, actually. Eventually, Elder Becker kind of brought it back around and asked her if she would be willing to take Bible studies from him. And she's, by this time, she was starting to feel bad about how ugly she was being. She wasn't raised that way. She was raised to be a, a, a nice Southern lady, right? And so she's thinking, I'm, I'm really, ah, I'm being so bad. I need to at least give him something. She said, well, I'll, maybe, this, maybe in the spring, because this was fall, maybe in the spring I would be able to. Her classes were about to begin at Columbus College and she was a little bit busy, not terribly busy, but a little bit busy. He looked at her and he said, well, you know, I just got here. And in six months, I may be very busy. I'm not as busy right now because I, I, I'm new here to town. This would be a great time for me to have Bible studies with, her, with you. And she thought, quit being such a beast. Just be nice. And so she said, okay, I'll do it. She had every intention of having her secretary call him that week and cancel the Bible studies, but she forgot. She forgot. It didn't mean anything to her. She forgot. And so he arrived at her office door, her, at, her, at the hospital. Here he was. Oh, no. Now she's stuck. Oh, you were, you, you were ready for our Bible study day? Yes, come right in, please. And so they sat down and had the Bible study, and she yawned and tried to stay awake, took off her jewelry, played with it on the table, tried to just do anything she could to ah, not just fall asleep in the middle of this thing. Finally, it was over, mercifully. And he left with a promise to come back the next week. Well, she was just as determined that he would not. She was going to have her secretary call, and, and that was, she was going to put an end to this, but she forgot. And there he was the next week, back at her doorstep, with some study about what the Bible says about itself or something like that. Didn't, none of it meant anything to her because she didn't believe in the Bible. She didn't care what the Bible said about itself. None of that mattered to her. 
So once again, she struggled to stay awake, struggled to not be completely bored, and he finally left with a promise to come back the next week. And she determined she was going to have her secretary call. And guess what? She forgot. And so the next week, here's Elder Becker at the doorstep again. And she has him in to her office. Sits, they sit down. And he starts this study. And about halfway through, she woke up from her dozing and realized he was saying something she'd really never heard a preacher say before. He was studying with her about the state of the dead. What happens when people die? What does the Bible say happens when people die? As a scientist, this really made sense to her. And she's thinking, the church has really changed a lot since the last time I was there. Whoa, a lot of changes. And at the end, he did, as we do when we give Bible studies, says, do you have any questions? And she's like, yeah, I, I do have a question. And, and the question is, do all churches teach this? And, she, and he said, no, but is it clear to you that that's what the Bible says? She said, it sure is. And she realized that if she had been so wrong about what the Bible taught about this topic, maybe there were other things that she was wrong about too. And maybe she owed it to herself to look into what the Bible had to say. Two years later, my parents were baptized. We, this is a picture of the little church on 17th Street. The one where she said we, she'd never go to. The one that she had <laughs> said she would rather do anything but go to that church. Your church is too small. If I was gonna to go to a church, I'd go to one of the big ones, one of the big, like First Baptist, one of the big ones downtown. I wish I had time to tell you the amazing story of my dad's conversion, how he changed from being an evolutionist to becoming a creationist. It happened in one day. But if you want that, if you want that story, you'll need to contact me, and I'll be glad to send you a, I'll be glad to send you part of that story. Or at least I'll be glad to tell you when my book about this is coming out, okay? <laughs> All right, so that's my ad for today. But I just wanna say that they, this changed their lives. This changed everything in their lives. No longer was the desire to make money number one in their lives. No longer was the desire for fame the most important thing in their lives. At this point, they gave their hearts completely to God and said, that's it. We're in all the way, all in. They started talking with some of the doctors in the Georgia Cumberland Conference realized that, in fact, the doctors of the Georgia Cumberland Conference were very instrumental in my father becoming a creationist. Again, I can't tell you all that story. It's really interesting, but just can't, don't have time because I want to leave some time for Cal, too. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the story. I'm, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to say here. <laughs> Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, well, let me just tell you real briefly what happened. Um, that my mother had been baptized in May, and my dad was nothing anywhere close to being interested in what she had gotten herself into. And at first he thought it was kind of a fad and that it was just gonna blow over, but it didn't. And when she started making changes, especially when the ham and bacon started leaving the table, that really upset him. And for the first time in their marriage, they started arguing. They, mother arranged through a, a social obligation she arranged for my dad to start Bible studies. And daddy started studying the Bible and he told the pastor, Elder Becker, he said, you know, all this makes sense. He says, I just can't get past Genesis one. That's the big problem for me. I could believe the Bible, I just can't get past Genesis one. And um, so the doctors of the Georgia Cumberland Conference learned about this because Elder Becker's sister-in-law was married to a doctor in the Georgia Cumberland Conference, Dr. Carmen. And so he learned about this. He got together with some of the other docs. He said, you know what? Let's do something to help the thrashes. Every now and then, the doctors of the Georgia Cumberland Conference would get together to have a picnic. They would gather at one of the other's home and just have a nice time together. And they started inviting my mom and dad to these gatherings. So they said, for one of these parties that we do, let's invite a special speaker. 
they invited Robert Gentry from, he was teaching at that time at Columbia Union, Union College in Washington, and they invited him to come down and give a talk about some research that he'd been doing about radioactive halos in rock. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with any of that research. Some of you, I know, are quite familiar with that. But you can, you can read about it, Creation's Tiny Mysteries, or Fingerprints of Creation. You can look that up online, and you'll, you'll find out about some of the research that he did about radioactivity in rocks and how there was no way for that radioactivity to arrive in that rock except that God put it there because it was instantaneous. Um, again, don't have time to get into everything, but I'm just trying to tell you the story. Bob Gentry came down, spoke to the group about his research and what he'd been learning about, these, about this radioactivity in rocks. My dad was absolutely dumbfounded. He had never heard one single shred of scientific evidence in support of creationism. Never. Because, my friends, it is not taught. It is not taught. Creationism or any support for creationism is not taught in our schools. And so he'd never heard anything like that. As he, drove, as he and my mother drove back home from North Georgia, where the little get-together was held, he looked over at my mother and he said, I went up there an atheist. I'm coming home a Seventh-day Adventist. He knew that if there was any evidence at all for creationism, he could be intellectually honest and accept it. So he did. That was the last hurdle. He was baptized in November about six months after my mother was, these same doctors started talking to my parents and introducing them to other people, people in the General Conference, people in the Southern Union, health, people who were interested in health and health reform. And they started introducing my parents to, and talking to them about concepts that Ellen White had laid out in her writings about natural remedies, treating disease, using the remedies that God has given us, and the establishment of home-like sanitariums in different places. Someone finally said to my parents, you know, you ought to go and visit those folks down at Wildwood. They, they're doing something like this. And so they did. They went and visited Wildwood, met Dr. Alan Harmer. Some of you may have known or know of Dr. Harmer. And they... Um, their minds started just being expanded about what medicine could look like. And do you have time for my uh, yeah. little personal testimony yeah, there? Please. When oh, I yes. when I went, I uh, was probably what about seven, eight five, six, eight years old, five, seven eight. Six. Okay, something. He was, in, little, he something was little. He was five eight. or six. Um, I do he, remember. He thinks a he bit was seven or eight, but he was younger. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, we went, and uh, my parents, of course, not convinced about natural remedies because, you know, what can water do and all these kind of things. And I happened to get the flu uh, while we were there. Started to run a fever and all of the things that you do when you get a flu. So the uh, wife of the, of the medical director there said, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll give him a hot half bath and um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And um, he may be he may be uh, all better uh, real quick. And they said, well, whatever. So they went off to do rounds over at the, the Wildwood um, Sanitarium that was there, the old sanitarium. Wait a minute. I yep. got to I got to interrupt you because I was there and I remember this too. Okay. All right. We had gone over to the, we had gone over the Harmers for lunch. Yep. And Cal was doing the wilted baby thing. You know how little tiny kids just kind of wilt when they don't feel good. And um, Mrs. Harmer said, let's give him a hot yep, bath. Yep, so we did the hot half and bath. And mother, mother was thinking, a hot bath? He's got a fever. Yeah. And we should be, should we be cooling him down instead of heating him up? <laughs> and so Mrs. Harmer gave mother a job. She said, you hold the watch. You have a second hand on your watch? Yes. She said, well, time us exactly for five minutes, because that's how old he was, was five years old. Yeah, okay, so I, I don't remember the hot half bath. I do remember oh, the cold pour. Oh, I do, because he screamed uh, a lot. Yeah, I remember the hot, yeah, I remember the cold pour, the screaming part. He screamed then, too. Yeah, yeah, that's, that was memorable. Uh, and then, of course, you know, went right to bed, and they went, they went off, 
And so in between uh, their uh, rounds, their mom called the home where I was, says, how's Cal doing? Well, he's, he's sleeping, really. He's been sleeping now for over an hour. Oh, he has. Well, at this point, she's freaking out on the other side. She says, oh, no, he's had a brain bleed. Oh, uh, no, he's got encephalitis. She, oh, no. She didn't know whether these country doctors knew the difference between uh, uh, sleep coma. and maybe he was in a coma. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe he's, he's, he's out. Maybe he's half dead. And, uh, but then, um, you know, within just a few hours, I was running around like abnormal again. And so they, <laughs> they thought, well, this, 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 uh, my mom told me, you know, that it made a real impression that this, this uh, hydrotherapy and these natural remedies, they, they really work. They really they worked. Something. Mother had her own personal experience with hydrotherapy. On another visit that we had there, she herself started to come down with a sore throat. And she knew how this was going to play out. Because this, when this happened to her, she knew she was going to lose her voice. She was going to be down for about three days. They might as well just go home. And so she mentioned to the folks that we were staying with, Brother and Sister Atherton. Some of you know the Athertons. Knew the Athertons. Um, she, she just happened to mention that she wasn't feeling well and she thought they were going to have to leave. And Brother Atherton said, oh, no, 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 don't go anywhere. We'll give you a treatment. She had already met, um, I can't remember her first name, Fields. It was the Fields' daughter, um, Jack and Joe's sister. She was the hydrotherapy, hydrotherapist there at, at Wildwood. And she had already shown Mother around the hydrotherapy um, un, uh, department there at the old sanitarium at Wildwood. And so she, Mother went down, not feeling very good, and so... Ms. Fields said, well, what we'll do is we'll give you a contrast shower. This was a 16-head shower, and um, Mother's like, okay, not a problem. And she, so she explained it to her. She said, it'll be, uh, be hot and cold, three minutes of hot, 30 seconds of cold, and then we'll repeat it three times. And Mother was like, I never do cold. And she said, well, it'll be okay. You'll, you'll be all right with it. And Mother's like, well, maybe I can just kind of scoot back in a little corner. You know, there's a way that I'll be, I'm sure there's a way I can get out of that cold stream. Except when she got into the shower, she couldn't because it was coming at her from all five directions. Head, all around. She just couldn't get away. And so when she put the hot water on, that actually was pretty hot, but it felt pretty good. But then Lorraine, that's her name. When Lorraine turned on the cold water, mom screamed. And Lorraine screamed too because it scared her. <laughs> but it was just the shock of the cold. After the treatment, Lorraine put mother on a bed, wrapped her up in blankets, gave her a little massage through the, through the blankets and told mother that she needed to sleep for an hour. When mother woke up, her sore throat was gone. Now, I'll tell you, Natural Remedies works, and it works fast. It doesn't always work that fast, True. but I think God did something. Once again, grace, you know, grace to help. So Dad decided that, Mother and Dad decided that Dad should go to Loma Linda to get a master's in public health. He wanted to learn how to educate his, his patients in healthful living. So he wound up at Loma Linda. When he came back, um, we started looking for a place to live. Oh, that's me. <laughs> well, that picture is a, is a picture of Dad at Loma Linda, and he's speaking to Glenn Phillips uh, there, and Glenn Phillips... Um, and someone else. That may be Roger Morton. I'm not it, sure It could be. Um, was uh, one of the uh, first uh, folks down here to join us uh, after they got done with the master's program. Uh, Dad and Mom had been talking about having some sort of home-like sanitarium concept, something like Wildwood, but much smaller. And so uh, Glenn and his wife, Mary Jean, came down, and several other people that had been part of this program came down and said, well, you're starting something new. We'll see how it goes. And um, we had been running a health food store out of our basement for some years. Um, people would come over and, and buy, you know, Loma Linda canned. You remember those things, the Loma Linda canned and Worthington canned products? And they would come over and buy those, you know, this is at that time, that was health foods, you know. You come that was all we Health knew. foods is to get the canned stuff. And so we were selling those, but pretty soon it got too big, you know, having to go up to Sovex and pick up things and so forth. And so decided to put the store into the, um, uh, the old uh, building, and uh, that's further on up uh, in your pictures there. I'm skipping ahead of you, Ann. That's behind uh, 
behind. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, so um, that that store, the old office building that she showed you before, became uh, the store which we called Staff O Life. And uh, Ann and I uh, actually ran that during the summer. And uh, I think we had maybe two customers. The biggest thing that we sold was peanut butter um, because nobody in Columbus knew anything about health foods. We know a lot about barbecue, but not so much about health foods. And uh, so- uh, but Natural peanut butter. We got it straight from Tom's from peanuts. Tom's and the uh, it, only peanut butter you can get or you could get at that time that was just straight peanuts or peanuts and salt and grind it up, you know? And so uh, you couldn't get it anyways, and now you can get it all over the place. But then, so the only, uh, only place you'd get it was Staff of Life in Columbus, Georgia. So we sold a lot of peanut butter. And I remember uh, Ann and I got those kosher marshmallows and roasted them over the heater <laughs> down below. Remember that? Yes. So at any rate- we, I remember our first $100 day at yeah. our store. It was just, wow, we were so thrilled. We'd already been open for about four years. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so that was in 1969. Uh, and so that was actually uh, our Country Life Health Food Store and City Outreach actually predates Uchi Pines. But we began to look for a piece of property uh, all in Georgia because, you know, we're Georgia crackers and we were looking for property in Georgia and um, couldn't find anything and had actually found one piece of property that we thought was the one. I remember planting some trees. So there's probably some fruit trees north of Columbus growing that we planted up on a piece of property that we finally never did get. But at any rate, so um, could, not all of those fell through. And um, my parents, getting a little bit, not discouraged, but just kind of not knowing which way to go with this thing, when a neighbor of ours that went to the Columbus Church, there's the only church really in this area, uh, Columbus First, but he lives, lived uh, about five miles west of us, west of Uch where Eugene Bynes is now, uh, here in Alabama. And he, he came up to my folks and he says, you know, have you ever thought about Alabama? And Dad said, he might as well have said, have you ever thought about Mars? Because they really hadn't thought about Alabama. You know, if somebody lives in Georgia, you don't think about Alabama. I guess it's probably the same thing with us in Alabama, thinking about Mississippi or whatever. But uh, at any rate, so never really thought about it. But then when they started thinking, I said, you know, why not? It's close by, and the property's cheaper, and, and you know, lots of land, and all and, the rest of that. And right about that time, also, Elder Wampler, who was the president of Alabama-Mississippi Conference, yeah. now Gulf States Conference, was saw my parents at a Southern Union meeting, and he said the same thing. Have you ever thought about starting a work in East Alabama? There's no church there. Hmm. Um, I uh, am not going to go into all the details of how how we ended up at this particular piece of property, but it was it was a it was a toss up between two, and we finally ended up with this one. Um, the 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 it was uh, a miracle. And so before um, we went too terribly far, all of the people from the conference office, Elder Wampler and the, and the officers are out here tramping around on the property. And he said, you know, this looks like a good piece of property for what you want to do. And so they were behind what we wanted to do too. And, and uh, I'm sure that they probably got a whole um, load of chiggers uh, because the, the, only thing, the only thing out here was wild horses. They kept wild horses on this property because it was far enough away from everybody that they rodeo would stay wild for the, yeah, for the rodeo. And uh, so at any rate, that was, that was the, uh, so we got this property and uh, it, it had belonged to the Howard family before. Uh, Ms. Howard uh, said she believed in what we were doing. That was one reason why we got this property. Uh, by the way, her husband had, was the most famous bootlegger during Prohibition. All kinds of stories about him that exist. Uh, he was never busted. It's amazing. He managed to get away from him every time. Um, but uh, we found some remnants of stills down in the, in the bottom of the hill here. And so we kind of feel like we redeemed the property, you know. Um, at any rate, this, this uh, building that you're sitting in is, uh, is that, that structure right there. Now realize that uh, it's a little smaller in that picture than it is currently because we knocked out the walls and, and enlarged it a little bit. But uh, that, that is the, uh, that's this building and it was the first building that we built here on campus, and you can see that um, Mom and uh, Ann and I actually were very uh, intimately involved in building this building. We, we tried to dig the footings. We got most we of it done. We did dig a lot. <laughs> um, but it turns out that this, pretty much everywhere, is sandy soil except for about right here, and there's a couple of other places, the, the cemetery, another place where we have to dig. But it, it, you know, we had to dig, got down about uh, half a foot, and it was like rock 
just that hard red clay and we'd chip away at it with our picks and stuff and finally after about two weeks of that dad had mercy on us and he rented somebody get rented a backhoe and they actually fixed finished it up for us well but, uh, and also a number of self-supporting institutions came down to help yep build the yep. place yep. this so. here we see brother chamness who was from oak haven some uh, of you may remember him and my mother yeah I was going to say I recognize him, but I don't remember his name. That's Brother Sailor there. Brother Sailor and Brother Jacobson. And Jacobson, yeah, yes, that's right. From Wildwood. So they, they laid the block on the outside. They were both from Wildwood. And uh, so had the building built. Go ahead. Um, the first thing that we did here on campus was a day camp for overweight girls. These are the overweight girls and me over there on the right-hand side. I was not overweight or a girl, but I managed to be in that whole group there. And... Um, Go to the next slide, Ann. I just want to show something real quick. That is the camper that we came out here uh, before we bought the property. We parked the camper, VW camper, right underneath these uh, oak trees over here where that little building is back behind. And uh, that camper was what we used to transport those overweight because we crammed them all into that uh, Volkswagen bus, you know, hanging out on all sides. And uh, so they were, they, we came here and they, what they did was, it was an early concept for lifestyle centers to learn how to live. Uh, so they would just live with us. And so when we had worship, they'd have worship. When we, I mean, not live all, we'd take them home at night, but you know, early in the morning, go pick them up. So we'd stop at each home and they'd come out and they'd have devotions with us and then we'd eat breakfast and then, you know, we'd go on from that. And of course it was lots of working out and then that was one of the, oh, that would be about where Willow is right now, I think. Yeah. As you're going to the Lifestyle Center from here, yeah. that's where the road runs through. Yeah, no, right. no buildings there in right that picture, here. but that was um, lots of little trees, well, brushy stuff to cut down and clear, and so the, that was part of what kept these uh, well, young ladies Something busy. funny, too, and that was that every time that the girls lost 10, one of the girls lost 10 pounds, they, we had a big ceremony yeah. on Friday afternoon, and the ceremony was that the girls would go out, the girl who lost 10 pounds would have the privilege of cutting down a tree. Yep. And so my mother would <laughs> my mother would have some trees oh, we selected. Made a big ceremony out oh, of it too. we'd we'd all we'd go march out. out there. Everybody would march out there. The girl would proudly carry the saw and a couple of other people would have a hatchet, you know, axe in case we needed it. And yep. off we'd go. Sing songs. We had like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I was like, cutting yeah, down the right. trees, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. That was fantastic. You know, and so had had we had several pictures, and they'd get the pictures. We had pictures on the wall. They were pictures thrilled of when they would, you know, how they would lose, and all those it was incredible. And so that was the first thing we had uh, here on on campus. And almost immediately, we had lifestyle guests in our home, and our home was our home was the lifestyle center. Uh, our home was the farmhouse. Was over the farmhouse, here, the old farmhouse. The first first and thing, Anne and I were the were the lifestyle counselors. I remember and the uh, guinea pigs. I remember I had there was one young fellow that was uh, not a whole lot older than I, that was my lifestyle guest, and uh, I was assigned to give him a hot half bath, which I did, and uh, so then it came time for the cold pour. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, cousin, cold pour. Some of came, you, came, some of you get some, this. Some of you, you experienced know. it. Maybe came time for the cold pour, and I said, okay, well, that's what we're going to do is we're going to you can stand up and we're going to turn on the cold cold shower for just you know a few seconds, and then we'll get out and dry off. And so. So, so he says, okay, you ready for this? And so I said, okay. So he stood up, turned on the cold water. Before the cold water hit, he went back down. Kaboosh, back in the water. About half of the hot water went all over me. And uh, so I, re I realized very quickly that when you're doing these things, sometimes you need to have some assistance with uh, people you know, standing up and so forth. He stood up a little too quickly with all the blood down at his feet. And he ended up, uh, so he's, he asked me again, are we ready for this? I said, uh, yeah, we're ready again, whenever you're ready. And so, uh, you know, he, he didn't sustain any horrible damage. So this is the building of our, our home after about two years uh, that we lived in the farmhouse. We were able to, a year, okay, we were able to build that home, which is Winona, um, up at the top of the hill. Uh, next slide. This one is actually the uh, building of the old lifestyle center we called it by the cherokee indian name Anvodi, and i just ruined the name but it really means get well place go back for just a second i want to talk about somebody else you see this fellow here the kind of hippie looking guy there in the middle yeah which one yeah yeah, yeah the hippie looking not not the yeah. one that's kneeling down there is is paul carpenter and so uh he was helping to build that building but uh the fellow that's in the middle there that that has the beard uh was roger srigley 
Uh, he was the first convert here. I mentioned to you, uh, well, I mentioned to the, to the staff when I was telling them that we were going to talk about some things, that uh, back in the early days, in the, in the 70s, there was a lot of hippies, and they just kind of roamed around. If you lived through that era, uh, you know, as people looking for stuff, I don't know what they were looking for, but... An, uh, an amazing number of them wound up here. Yeah, there was just, people would just show up and say, I heard you had a commune, I just wanted to, you know, check it out. And so they come down, and he was, he was one that came down and says, you looking, he was a, he was a British fellow, and he says, you're looking for a carpenter. And he said, well, you know, you should always use somebody that, that, can, uh, that, can, that can drive nails, and so... He stayed with us for a long time. I don't even remember how many. It was months. And uh, in the process, uh, began taking Bible studies and ended up being a Seventh-day Adventist. And so he went from being hippie to being Adventist. Uh, yeah, hippie to being happy. Okay, and, and so go on. That's the finished product, uh, the um, old lifestyle center. The uh, uh, back up. On this, on this one side was the treatment side. On the side that's the closest to you is the side where the uh, family that was going to uh, be the administration of the minister of the, the building and so forth, which is uh, June Bigham is sitting here. She remembers those days that she, she lived on that side of the, of the building. The family lived on that side to, uh, to, to do it. I don't know if that was how long that lasted because it seemed like we needed more rooms and so they ended up getting pushed out. And I remember that there actually used to be an office in that side, but it, it, the wall got knocked out and the office went away. It ended up being in the, the old business office for the business part, and that kitchen got enlarged a little bit. It's not very large as it is, but at any rate, so that was the original building, and then we added onto that and added onto that, and so it kind of you know, ended up in various places. And some of you are now staying in it as our guest housing. So as we progressed, go on to the next one. This, uh, huh? Oh, okay. We, we ended up, uh, you know, with actually an institute with a campus and uh, a farm and all of these things that we have. And we used to spell it Y-U-C-H-I, and we changed it to U-C-H-E-E -E because everybody was pronouncing it yucky. <laughs> uh, so yucky pines. And then we, we changed it to U-C-H-E, and now everybody calls it uchy. M mother Sometimes said, people call it itchy. Mother said uh, she was tired of being Dr. Trash from Yucky Pines. Yeah, Dr. Trash from Yucky Pines. So. <laughs> So, oh, the most weird thing about that, we actually got a letter here one time that was addressed to Dr. Yuchi and Dr. Pines. In, in Alabama. In Alabama. No seal, no zip code, nothing. Just U Dr. Yuchi, Dr. Pines, Alabama. And it actually arrived here. I, I don't know how the post, postmaster figured that out. But we had, we had quite a, the, um, one of the first buildings on campus is this little caboose. And we probably, uh, I'd need to wind this up because we're, we're running out of time here, but the little caboose um, actually was a donation. Mom had read someplace in one of the medical journals that a physician had uh, a little place where he uh, had people to come, uh, similar to the idea that they were thinking of doing, and, and using a, a, a um, uh, railroad car as guest housing. And so she wrote to several of the railroad companies at the time and said, you know, we're, we're looking for a railroad car that we could use for guest housing and wanted to know if anybody's, you know, getting rid of something that we might be able to buy. The only one that responded was the president of the Southern Railway Company. They had bought the um, Central of Georgia rail line and he said, we, we have a whole bunch of cabooses that are being, you know, taken out of service wanted to know if you want to have one. She said, well, yes, uh, you know, how much would it cost? And he said, well, we'll give it to you. He said, well, I, I wasn't quite sure from your letter whether you wanted to buy it or whether you wanted us to give it to you. Said, well, of course you want to give it to us. And so, you know, we'll take that. And so he said, okay, well, just tell us where you want it put and we'll, we'll come and bring it to you. And so she said, well, what do you want us to do? Should we clear the, pr the no, just tell us where you want it put. And what, well, should we, uh, you know, put down some tracks or just tell us where you want it put and, and we'll take care of it. And so it started to register that they were going to take care of the whole thing. And so they brought down a caboose down to that railroad. If you came in on Highway 39, Ruc Knuckles Road, you went over that rough railroad track there. And they brought it down to that crossing and put it and got a crane and lifted it up and put it on a low boy and brought it out here. And it made the news. Channel 9, Channel 3, all of them were out here, you know, filming this caboose being loaded out into the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and so we, we have that caboose there as, uh, as our guest housing now. And that was part of, the, part of our uh, early stories. Um, one other little thing that I'll mention 
is um, back when we first started, it's kind of a funny little story about um, people from the city. Uh, <clears throat> if you're from the city, my apologies. <laughs> but one time we were all from the city, and so you know, I guess it's, a, it's kind of an interesting journey. But we had some folks that came here from New York City, and uh, the only guest housing that we had was the um, caboose, and so they stayed in the caboose. When they came for breakfast the next morning, of course, came to our house because that was the only, you know, it was, it was it. And so they came up to our house and uh, to have breakfast. And so we said, well, ha did you have a good, uh, good night's sleep? Well, yes, it slept pretty good, except the only thing was, you know, all those sirens going off, you know, that kind of kept us awake for a while. And it's, it took a while for us to go to sleep. Sirens. You know, back in, in the early 70s, you don't hear any, you didn't hear anything out here. If you heard a siren, it was like uh, something really bad just happened because, you know, there's a siren going off. So the sirens, yeah, just sirens going and going and sirens. It was really a problem. But, you know, we finally got to sleep and slept good. You know, everything was good. And so, well, that evening we were sitting out in the front porch and talking and so forth. And the uh, whippoorwills, the Chuck Wills widows cranked up. You know, Will's widow, Chuck Will's widow. So those little sirens again. You know, uh, that's not a siren. That's a bird. <laughs> and uh, so they they learned. We've had several individuals who've learned some things. The same individuals uh, thought that the tomato, the little green tomatoes, were watermelons. They look, and there's watermelons growing. You know, those are tomatoes. And uh, never seen them growing on the vine. Always seen them in the grocery store. You know, you just pick them up. And uh, so that was uh, kind of an interesting story. But uh, several people that, that came here just as providence from God, we just have to say that, that it was providence from God. Our, our first farm manager and actually uh, kind of all around people, it was just wonderful, uh, family just showed up one Friday evening. We were sitting out on the front porch over there in the old house, uh, farmhouse, um, having worship, family worship there, evening worship, getting ready for the Sabbath to come in. And uh, it wasn't quite sundown yet, so we were singing, and this, this uh, car drives up, the station wagon, piled, you know, looked like uh, the Beverly Hillbillies with all this stuff all over the car and everything. And the man got out, and he says, is this where Bernard Rappel lives? And I said, well, he had been here, but he'd, he'd left, he'd gone on to something else. Uh, for, he actually had only been here for a few, few weeks, and so he wasn't here for long. But uh, they knew him, and so he said, yes, well, you're in the right place, but, you know, he's, he's, he's here. Come on in. And that family, the Johnson family, ended up staying with us for some years and helped us get established uh, here at UG Pines. So um, providences. Uh, I was going to transition and go to the new Lifestyle Center, but I'll, and we don't really have time for that. But all I can say is that there are so many providences in, in this work. Um, the reason that the new Lifestyle Center, which is just the Lifestyle Center now, is there is not because of my wonderful acumen as a fundraiser or anything like that. It just is a, is a providence from God. It's all miracles, one right after the other. There are miracles from, from uh, all sides on that. Oh, well, a story about the tent. Okay, we'll finish with this one because we're, we're just about to cut into to, uh, the, our, our conference president is here. It will have the next segment at noon. And uh, so we want, don't want to cut into his time. But um, I remember that I was voted as the president in 1999. And that same year, the board voted that we would again uh, talk about, uh, uh, move forward with building a new lifestyle center and uh, taking a little hiatus from, from that you know, uh, focus, of trying to get a church built, but then uh, went back to the lifestyle center that year. So I kind of thought, well, I guess that's what they want me to focus on is building this lifestyle center. So I guess we'll do that. And I had gone to the, the board and asked them, you know, where's your line of credit? And, you know, so, you know, we don't do that. And in fact, the board actually was very pointed and said, you, we don't want you to go into debt. And I said, I don't know how to do that. I run a business, but you know, you always go with uh, what you can arrange at the bank. You know, you go down and if you, if you can get a $50,000 loan, you build a $50,000 warehouse. And if you can get a $100,000 loan, you build a $100,000 warehouse. And if you can't get any loan, you don't build any warehouse. And uh, you know, so I didn't know how you do that. And they said, well, the, what we do is, you know, we move forward in faith and the Lord provides. Christian, but I didn't understand that, I, I'll be honest with you, and because um, I know you don't go into the bank and they say, what's your collateral? You say, well, we, we have some faith here. We'd like to be able to put that up. I don't usually take that. And so I didn't know how to proceed. And so, you know, I was talking to my sister who lived in, um, I believe you were in St. Louis at that time. 
And, and I said, you know, Ann, I, I think I bit off more than I can chew with this thing. I, I don't know how we're going to, because they were saying we needed $4 million, and I, just, I don't know. I, I know some people that might have that kind of money, but I don't know them well enough to ask them for it. And, and I certainly don't have that kind of money. I don't, don't have a you know, bank account that couldn't write that kind of a check or anything. I, I just don't know. I think this is something else. And uh, my, sist uh, my wife, I'm sorry, my wife was in the other, she's in the kitchen, and she shouted in, you don't have any faith. And I said, I know I don't have any faith. And Ann just said, well, why don't we pray? So we prayed. And uh, she, she prayed a beautiful prayer and said, you know, Lord, increase my brother's faith. <laughs> you know, the Lord, sometimes he directly answers prayer. And I think sometimes he does it just to buttress your faith. Sometimes he lets you, you know, gr grow. And, and, and uh, it's not quite so quickly, but this particular time, what happened is the next day, and I kid you not, I was sitting in my office over at the old business office, and whoever was, I think it was Sister Champ, and buzzed the, you know, the thing, and she said, I just opened the mail. And we just got a, a check for the new lifestyle center. Well, I hadn't even done any fundraising. I hadn't even asked anybody. I mean, I didn't think anybody even knew we were doing much. We'd just, you know, kind of been doing some preliminary things and, you know, little plans and that. And, and she says, no, we got, a, we got a, a donation in for the new lifestyle center. I said, we did. I said, well, that's wonderful. How much did we get? She says, $10,000. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> but, you know, because to me, now I realize $10,000 when you think it's, you know, we need $4 million and you know, it's not, not a whole lot, but uh, it's something. And I think, too, it was the Lord saying, I've got this. You know, don't, don't worry about this. I, I have this. You, you move forward. You do what you need to do. Doesn't mean we don't ask anybody. Doesn't, doesn't mean we don't do our part. And, and all that, but, uh, but the Lord was saying, before you even asked, I have this under control. You know, I can, I can do this. And, and yeah, and so I was, I was able to say, I don't, I don't know how to do it, but I know God does. And you know, he's got a thousand ways to ha handle things that we haven't even thought of yet. And uh, so all we need is one. And uh, he, he worked it out for us. And and again, the center, there was story after story of those kind of things that just, you couldn't have arranged it. And uh, the Lord provided, and there it is. And uh, so we have to say, well, praise the Lord, here we are. And it's not because uh, of us that we're here, although uh, the Lord does use us to do things, but it's because of his providence that we're here. Why don't you stand and close with a word of prayer? By the way, as we go through the week, you'll have the opportunity to listen to different people tell their stories and it'll be, some, some of this may be some of the same stories with a lot more flavor to it because it'll be from other people's perspective. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful once again for your guidance. Thankful for your providences. Thankful that you are our God and you can do anything. And so we ask as we proceed through this week and we talk about all of the things that have happened, the way that you've led us in the past, may all the honor and glory go to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.